Here is my MIDI controller that I am calling the BF8. It has eight faders. Each fader has a corresponding toggle switch. There is a four digit seven segment display and a button for programming. Let me show you how it works. Here in my DAW, I have eight tracks that correspond to the eight tracks of the controller. From left to right, we have guitar left, guitar right, lead guitar, bass guitar, keys, snare, kick, and overhead. You can see that while the track plays, I can move the physical faders, and the faders in my DAW move accordingly. Additionally, I can use these toggle switches to mute tracks as I please. Also, notice that as I move the faders, the 7 segment display shows the MIDI value that is being sent out. MIDI values can be between 0 and 127, and that's exactly what you see here. Since toggle switches like these are essentially binary, they only send out a value of 0 in the low position, and 127 in the high position. I don't want to get too into the weeds with DAW specific details, but I'll briefly show you here how my DAW is currently configured. Here under the Actions menu in Reaper, if you search for Track Volume, you can see that there's a parameter that's called Track Set Volume for Track 1, and you can see that next to it, there's a shortcut for that action, which in my case is MIDI Channel 1 CC10, which is what my first fader is currently outputting. I can't really speak to any other DAWs, although I'm very certain they all have similar features, but in Reaper, if I wanted this fader to instead control another parameter, this is how I would do it. Let's say that instead of volume, I want these to be pan knobs instead. First, let's search for pan. There are a million things in Reaper that can be controlled, but what I want is this one that says track, set pan for track 1. Currently, there is no shortcut for it, so I'm going to select it, click add, and then move the fader. Now, as you can see, if you move the fader too much, and you already have that fader map elsewhere, you get a ton of these pop-ups. So either delete the other shortcut first, or be careful to not move the fader too much. At any rate, now this fader is mapped to pan instead of volume. I'm going to mute the other tracks with these switches, then press play and move the fader back and forth. If you are listening in stereo, you can hear that values above 63 pan to the right, and values below 63 pan to the left. If you are listening in mono, just look here at the visual representation. For the programming portion of this demonstration, I'm going to be using a program called MIDI View. At the top, it shows that I am connected to the BF8, and if I move a fader, it shows the MIDI signals that are sent out. From left to right, we have the time, whether the signal was sent out or received, the message, which in MIDI is also known as the CC, or continuous control, the channel, the value sent, and the hex code for the MIDI packet. Note that here under message, it's showing the standard name for MIDI CC values. Here is a list of all the CC values according to the MIDI standard, and there will be a link attached to this video if you want to go over it. But let me make it clear that this message actually has nothing to do with what the BF8 is actually going to be controlling, unless you hook it up to something that recognizes those values. If that's not currently clear, let me go through the programming, and that should make things easier to understand. The BF8 has four modes that you can cycle through with this button. Operation mode, which is the default, fader program, button program, and channel program. If you don't cycle all the way around, the unit defaults to operation mode after delay. According to the MIDI standards, CCs 20 through 31 are undefined, so I'm going to use those just for demonstration. Let's say that you want to program the leftmost fader to output CC20. First, press the program button once to enter fader program mode, then move that fader until the value reaches 20. Leave it for a moment, and once the display flashes and the C disappears, you can now see that I am outputting values between 0 and 127 on CC20 with the first fader. Let's set the second fader to CC21 the same way. In this way, you can program any fader to control whatever CC parameter you wish. This program is the same for switches. For this example, let's set the first switch to CC23. Press the program button twice, move the first fader to 23, wait a moment, 
and now the switch is programmed to either send out a value of 127 or 0 on CC23. Lastly, you can change the channel of the entire unit the same way. Just note that according to the MIDI standards, there are only 16 channels, starting with 1 instead of 0. We can set the BF8 to be on any channel, let's say 5, by pressing the program button to cycle to the channel program mode, move any fader to the desired value, wait a moment, and now the unit is programmed to output on channel 5 in this case. Note that changing the channel does not affect the CC assignment of the faders or switches in any way. If you're interested in buying one of these, I'll have information in the description about how to do just that. The rest of this video is going to go into detail about how the unit actually works and how you can build one yourself, as well as limitations and some design mistakes I made and will be correcting. I do encourage you to check those sections out to get the full picture, especially if you want to buy one. But if you weren't interested in all that, thank you for stopping by and I hope you enjoyed. As someone who spends a lot of time in front of a computer making music, having something physical to interact with really excites me. There's something about turning knobs and sliding faders that just feels better than clicking and dragging on the screen, you know? So a few weeks ago, I set out to make a unit that does just that, allows me to physically interact with the music I am making on the screen. So working backwards from what I want, I realized that I would need some kind of USB interface to the computer, and some kind of protocol to actually interact with the computer. Being that it's music that I'm dealing with, MIDI, or the Musical Instrument Digital Interface, is the obvious first choice. I did a quick search on YouTube, probably like you just did to find this video, and found a unit called Fader 4 by a fantastic channel called Notes and Volts. I've since become a big fan of his and I highly recommend you check his channel out. He does some really great stuff and I want to make no bones about the fact that his Fader 4 is a direct ancestor of my BF8. In fact, my initial thought was to create what I was going to call the Fader 8, but he clearly beat me to it, so I had to change it up. Anyway, quick shout out to Notes and Volts, and if you ever see this, Thank you very much for the inspiration. So I saw the Fader 4 project, and I knew that I wanted at least 8 channels on my project, and I also wanted buttons, because I figured that besides adjusting levels, the most common thing that I do in my DAW is mute and solo tracks. Also, I personally feel that if you're going to take inspiration from another project, it's best if you can at least attempt to improve on it. Hopefully, my BF8 inspires someone else to make something even better, and if you are that person, please share, because I would genuinely love to see it. Like the Fader 4, I wanted a program button and some UI in the form of a 7 segment display. But I did wind up implementing both of those features a bit differently than he did, which I will come to shortly. At this point, my design parameters are 8 faders, 9 buttons, 8 tracks, and 1 program, with a 4 digit 7 segment display. With that in mind, there are a number of microcontrollers that will satisfy those needs, but the one I settled on was the Arduino Micro architecture. The reason I am saying Arduino Micro Architecture is because I'm actually using a clone board based on the Pro Micro by SparkFun, which itself is a modification of the open source Arduino Micro. The differences are beyond the scope of this video, but suffice it to say that I am essentially using the Arduino Micro, which in turn uses the Atmega 32U4 microcontroller. To simplify the UI element, I went with the display breakout board based on the TM1637 LED driver chip that only requires four connections, power, ground, clock, and data. So adding everything up, eight pins for the faders, eight pins for the switches, one pin for the button, and two pins for the display equals more pins than I have available on the Pro Micro. So I had to use a multiplexer. I went with the CD4051, which gives me eight analog inputs to connect to the faders at the cost of four digital pins and one analog pin on the Pro Micro. So here in the schematic, you can see that all the faders go to the analog inputs of the multiplexer. Then the multiplexer passes that data to the Pro Micro. Note that these are dual gang potentiometers that I am using for the faders, but I'm only using one of the gangs. This is because they were affordable and available when I was prototyping, and for no other reason. On future revisions, I will likely source different pots and change the board so the footprint matches. There are some capacitors here on the faders that I'm using to filter out some noise, and other than that, there's really not much else to say about the schematic. It's mostly just hooking things up to the Arduino. So let's take a look at the code and see how it all works. Here's the code for the BF8. First, we include a couple libraries to help us along. The MIDI USB library makes sending out the MIDI packets very simple. TM1637 gives us a couple of functions to use the 7-segment display. 
Bounce2 is just a debounce library that ensures the switches or buttons don't get triggered multiple times per press, and eeprom is the library that allows us to write to the Arduino's eeprom so we can permanently save our settings between sessions, even when the unit is powered off. Next are the pin definitions, which just makes referencing the pins more human readable in the code. After that are the default CC settings for a new unit. By default, the faders control CCs 1 through 8, and the switches, which are still referred to internally as buttons because they used to be, are programmed to 9 through 16. Below that are the settings for the data smoothing that I'll do later, as well as the program timeout, which is how long the unit waits to return to normal operation mode if you're programming it. Next are a bunch of definitions for the display. This commented section is here just in case I want to add messages later. I just went ahead and took the time to write out the binary for a bunch of letters so that I could use them in the future if needed. Below that are the definitions for the things that I am actually displaying. It's essentially the same as the above section, but this uses the TM1637 library, so it's formatted a bit differently. I'll briefly show you how it works. If I wanted to show F1 on the display, then I would perform bitwise OR operations on segments A, E, F, and G for the first digit, segments B and C for the second digit, and nothing for the next two digits. This is all packaged as one object, and I can pass that to the TM1637, and it knows how to make sense of that and displays the proper message. Next are all the variables that I'm using in the code, which I think are better explained in situ, so I'll move on, though it is all commented here if you want to pause and take a look at it. Setup is simple. We just set the pin mode for the inhibit, A, B, and C pins of the CD4051. Then we pull the inhibit pin low, which allows us to actually use the chip. This pin could have just been tied to ground, but since I had extra pins to work with on Arduino, I hooked it up such that I could toggle the inhibit pin in the future revisions if I needed to. No idea why I would need that, but at least I have the option. Then, there's just a for loop that iterates over all the buttons and attaches a 5 millisecond debounce to each one. Below that, we set the brightness of the display to 4 on a scale of 0 to 7. This is just my personal preference. Then, we clear the display. Next, we fill the readings array of each of the faders with zeros to start with. This array is how we are going to keep a running average of all the analog readings for smoothing, which will be touched on shortly. Lastly, we read from the EEPROM to see if we have saved data there. If there's a value below 1 or above 127, we know that's invalid data for a CC message, and we just set that fader or button to its default value as defined above. The same thing happens with the unit's MIDI channel, but the values are between 1 and 16 instead. Alright, now to the meat of the code. I'll first jump down to the very bottom and go over the two functions that we need to define. The first is the send MIDI function, which accepts the CC value and the MIDI value. Here, a MIDI packet is created with a header byte, a byte that contains a command and the MIDI channel, which are ORed together, the CC, and the value. Those first two bytes are to do with the USB protocol, I believe, and I've not really dug too much into it, but it's there to make the library work. The packet is sent out, and the buffer is flushed. Then, we have a function that just tells the display what to do during normal operation. It just takes a value and plugs it into a function that comes with the library. The parameters are the desired value in decimal, a boolean for leading zeros, the number of digits to display, and the starting position from the left. Inside the loop is where all of the rest of the code lives. First, we handle the program button. The debouncing library from earlier gives us a few functions that will help monitor the button. First, we read the state of the button. Then we check if the state rose, meaning that it went from a low to high state. This is only going to happen once per press. Then, we cycle through the different program modes. Mode 0 is normal operation, 1 programs the faders, 2 programs the buttons, and 3 programs the channel. We keep track of the last time that the button was pressed, and in the next if statement, we address that timeout. We check the current time against the last time the button was pressed, and if it's been longer than our timeout period, we continue. We then check which program mode we are in and update the appropriate EEPROM address with new data if it's changed from last time. This cuts down a bit on how often the EEPROM is rewritten since there are a limited number of write cycles available before there's some data degradation, although I don't foresee anybody ever coming close to that with this unit. Next, we address the case where the program mode is zero, or in other words, we are in normal operation. We loop over each of the faders first. 
To get the correct pin from the multiplexer, we just count up in binary with these three bitwise operations. Then we read the analog pin. Since that pin is susceptible to noise and the readings tend to jitter, we do some data smoothing via a running average. First, we take out the oldest reading, replace it with the current analog value, and sum the total. Then we average the total over the number of samples we've taken and map that to a value between 0 and 128. MIDI values, as mentioned before, can only be between 0 and 127, but I was never getting 127 as a valid output because of the averaging, so I'm now mapping it to 128 and just bumping it back down to 127 if it ever happens to get that high. Anyway, at that point, we send the MIDI packet out with that value, as mentioned before, and update the display. The button logic is similar, except we don't have to do the bitwise stuff to select the pin on the multiplexer since the buttons all have their own pins, and we don't have to do any averaging since we're just looking for a high or low state. If a button is pressed, or a switch is thrown in actuality, it shows the name of that button on the screen, then after a second it reverts back to the last displayed value. That's it for the code, but before I wrap up, I want to briefly mention that the unit is designed to be Eurorack compatible. It's 3 units tall and 42 HP wide. Being that it's USB powered and controlled, it's probably not the best fit for most people's modular synth rigs, but at least it's compatible with a popular standard so you can find a case for it if you need to, or you can make your own of course like I have. Like a dummy, I neglected to take into account the width of the rails when I designed this one though, so I will be ordering a revised board soon that will fit perfectly. I do want to sell these if anyone is interested. My contact information will be in the description of this video if you want to get in touch. I'll sell it as a kit or pre-assembled, just get with me and we'll work out the details. There will also be a link to a GitHub repo where you can download everything yourself and make your own if you wish. If you do, please let me know so I can see it. Also, if you do order one from me, rest assured that it will be a revision where it actually fits inside the Eurorack case. I'm not going to be sending out these in their current state. So that's really it. Thank you all so much for watching this video and thanks again to Notes and Volts for the inspiration. I'll put any errata in the description and will continue to update the firmware over time as people invariably tell me how it can be improved because I'm sure there's still a lot of room for it. Thanks again and have a great day.